Book One, Chapter Six of the Age of Innocence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton. Book One, Chapter Six. That evening, after Mr. Jackson had taken himself away, and the ladies had retired to their chintz curtained bedroom, Newland Archer mounted thoughtfully to his own study. A vigilant hand had, as usual, kept the fire alive and the lamp trimmed, and the room, with its rows and rows of books, its bronze and steel statuettes of the fencers on the mantelpiece, and its many photographs of famous pictures, looked singularly homelike and welcoming. As he dropped into his armchair near the fire, his eyes rested on a large photograph of May Welland, which the young girl had given him in the first days of their romance, and which had now displaced all the other photographs on the table. With a new sense of awe he looked at the frank forehead, serious eyes and gay, innocent mouth of the young creature whose soul's custodian he was to be. That terrifying product of the social system he belonged to and believed in. The young girl who knew nothing and expected everything, looked back at him like a stranger through May Welland's familiar features, and once more it was borne in on him that marriage was not the safe anchorage he had been taught to think, but a voyage on uncharted seas. The case of the Countess Olenska had stirred up old settled convictions and set them drifting dangerously through his mind. His own exclamation, Women should be free, as free as we are, struck to the root of the problem that it was agreed in his world to regard as non-existent. Nice women, however wronged, would never claim the kind of freedom he meant, and generous-minded men like himself were therefore in the heat of argument, the more chivalrously ready to concede it to them. Such verbal generosities were in fact only a humbugging disguise of the inexorable conventions that tied things together and bound people down to the old pattern. But here he was pledged to defend, on the part of his betrothed cousin, conduct that, on his own wife's part, would justify him in calling down on her all the thunder of church and state. Of course the dilemma was purely hypothetical. Since he wasn't a blackguard Polish nobleman, it was absurd to speculate what his wife's rights would be if he were. But Newland Archer was too imaginative not to feel that, in his case and May's, the tie might gall for reasons far less gross and palpable. What could he and she really know of each other, since it was his duty as a decent fellow to conceal his past from her, and hers as a marriageable girl to have no past to conceal? What if, for some one of the subtler reasons that would tell with both of them, they should tire of each other, misunderstand or irritate each other? He reviewed his friend's marriages, the supposedly happy ones and saw none that answered even remotely to the passionate and tender comradeship which he pictured as his permanent relation with May Welland. He perceived that such a picture presupposed on her part the experience, the versatility, the freedom of judgment, which she had been carefully trained not to possess. And with a shiver of foreboding he saw his marriage becoming what most of the other marriages about him were a dull association of material and social interests, held together by ignorance on one side and hypocrisy on the other. Lawrence Lefferts occurred to him as the husband who had most completely realized this enviable ideal. As became the most high priest of form, he had formed a wife so completely to his own convenience that, in the most conspicuous moments of his frequent love affairs with other men's wives, she went about in smiling unconsciousness, saying that Lawrence was so frightfully strict, and had been known to blush indignantly and avert her gaze when someone alluded in her presence to the fact that Julius Beaufort, as became a foreigner of doubtful origin, 
had what was known in new york as another establishment archer tried to console himself with the thought that he was not quite such an ass as larry lefferts nor may such a simpleton as poor gertrude but the difference was after all one of intelligence and not of standards in reality they all lived in a kind of hieroglyphic world where the real thing was never said or done or even thought but only represented by a set of arbitrary signs as when mrs welland who knew exactly why archer had pressed her to announce her daughter's engagement at the beaufort ball and had indeed expected him to do no less yet felt obliged to simulate reluctance and the air of having had her hand forced quite as in the books of primitive man that people of advanced culture were beginning to read the savage bride is dragged with shrieks from her parents tent the result of course was that the young girl who was the centre of this elaborate system of mystification remained the more inscrutable for her very frankness and assurance she was frank poor darling because she had nothing to conceal assured because she knew nothing to be on her guard against and with no better preparation than this she was to be plunged overnight into what people evasively called the facts of life the young man was sincerely but placidly in love he delighted in the radiant good looks of his betrothed in her health her horsemanship her grace and quickness at games and the shy interest in books and ideas that she was beginning to develop under his guidance she had advanced far enough to join him in ridiculing the idols of the king but not to feel the beauty of ulysses and the lotus eaters she was straightforward loyal and brave she had a sense of humor chiefly proved by her laughing at his jokes and he suspected in the depths of her innocently gazing soul a glow of feeling that it would be a joy to waken but when he had gone the brief round of her he returned discouraged by the thought that all this frankness and innocence were only an artificial product untrained human nature was not frank and innocent it was full of twists and defences of an instinctive guile and he felt himself oppressed by this creation of factitious purity so cunningly manufactured by a conspiracy of mothers and aunts and grandmothers and long-dead ancestresses because it was supposed to be what he wanted what he had a right to in order that he might exercise his lordly pleasure in smashing it like an image made of snow there was a certain triteness in these reflections they were those habitual to young men on the approach of their wedding day but they were generally accompanied by a sense of compunction and self-abasement of which newland archer felt no trace he could not deplore as thackeray's heroes so often exasperated him by doing that he had not a blank page to offer his bride in exchange for the unblemished one she was to give him he could not get away from the fact that if he had been brought up as she had they would have been no more fit to find their way than the babes in the woods nor could he for all his anxious cogitations see any honest reason any that is unconnected with his own momentary pleasure and the passion of masculine vanity why his bride should not have been allowed the same freedom of experience as himself such questions at such an hour were bound to drift through his mind but he was conscious that their uncomfortable persistence and precision were due to the inopportune arrival of the countess olenska here he was at the very moment of his betrothal a moment for pure thoughts and cloudless hopes pitchforked into a coil of scandal which raised all the special problems he would have preferred to let lie hang ellen olenska he grumbled as he covered his fire and began to undress he could not really see why her fate should have the least bearing on his yet he dimly felt that he had only just begun to measure the risk of the championship which his engagement had forced him on a few days later the bolt fell the lovell mingotts had sent out cards for what was known as a formal dinner that is three extra footmen two dishes for each course and a roman punch in the middle and had headed their invitations with the words 
to meet the Countess Olenska, in accordance with the hospitable American fashion, which treats strangers as if they were royalties, or at least their ambassadors. The guests had been selected with the boldness and discrimination in which the initiated recognized the firm hand of Catherine the Great, associated with such immemorial standbys as the Selfridge Marys, who were asked everywhere because they always had been, the Beauforts, on whom there was a claim of a relationship, and Mr. Sillerton Jackson and his sister Sophie, who went wherever her brother told her to, were some of the most fashionable and yet most irreproachable of the dominant young married set, the Lawrence Leffertses, Mrs. Lefferts Rushworth, the lovely widow, the Harry Thorleys, the Reggie Chiverses, and young Morris Dagonet and his wife, who was a van der Leyden. The company indeed was perfectly assorted, since all the members belonged to the little inner group of people who, during the long New York season, disported themselves together daily and nightly with apparently undiminished zest. Forty-eight hours later the unbelievable had happened. Everyone had refused the Mingott's invitation except the Beauforts and old Mr. Jackson and his sister. The intended slight was emphasized by the fact that even the Reggie Chiverses, who were of the Mingott clan, were among those inflicting it, and by the uniform wording of the notes, in all of which the writers regretted that they were unable to accept, without the mitigating plea of a previous engagement that ordinary courtesy prescribed. New York society was in those days far too small and too scant in its resources, for everyone in it, including livery stable keepers, butlers, and cooks, not to know exactly on which evenings people were free. And it was thus possible for the recipients of Mrs. Lovell Mingott's invitations to make cruelly clear their determination not to meet the Countess Olenska. The blow was unexpected, but the Mingotts, as their way was, met it gallantly. Mrs. Lovell Mingott confided the case to Mrs. Welland, who confided it to Newland Archer, who, aflame at the outrage, appealed passionately and authoritatively to his mother, who, after a painful period of inward resistance and outward temporizing, succumbed to his instances, as she always did, and immediately embracing his cause with an energy redoubled by her previous hesitations, put on her grey velvet bonnet and said, I'll go and see Louise Evangeliden. The New York of Newland Archer's day was a small and slippery pyramid, in which as yet hardly a fissure had been made or a foothold gained. At its base was a firm foundation of what Mrs. Archer called plain people, an honorable but obscure majority of respectable families who, as in the case of the Spicers or the Leffertses or the Jacksons, had been raised above their level by marriage with one of the ruling clans. People, Mrs. Archer always said, were not as particular as they used to be, and with old Catherine Spicer ruling at one end of Fifth Avenue and Julius Beaufort the other, you couldn't expect the old traditions to last much longer. Firmly narrowing upward from this wealthy but inconspicuous substratum was the compact and dominant group which the Mingotts, Newlands, Chiverses, and Mansons so actively represented. Most people imagined them to be the very apex of the pyramid, but they themselves, at least those of Mrs. Archer's generation, were aware that, in the eyes of the professional genealogist, only a still smaller number of families could lay claim to that eminence. Don't tell me, Mrs. Archer would say to her children, all this modern newspaper rubbish about a New York aristocracy. If there is one, neither the Mingotts nor the Mansons belong to it. No, nor the Newlands or the Chiverses either. Our grandfathers and great-grandfathers were just respectable English or Dutch merchants, who came to the colonies to make their fortune and stayed here because they did so well. One of your great-grandfathers signed the Declaration, and another was a general on Washington's staff, and received General Burgoyne's sword after the Battle of Saratoga. These are things to be proud of, but they have nothing to do with rank or class. 
New York has always been a commercial community, and there are not more than three families in it who can claim an aristocratic origin in the real sense of the word. Mrs. Archer and her son and daughter, like everyone else in New York, knew who these privileged beings were, the Dagonets of Washington Square, who came of an old English family allied with the Pitts and Foxes, the Lannings, who had intermarried with the descendants of Count de Grasse, and the van der Luydens, direct descendants of the first Dutch governor of Manhattan, and related by pre-revolutionary marriages to, to several members of the French and British aristocracy. The Lannings survived only in the person of two very old but lively Miss Lannings, who lived cheerfully and reminiscently among family portraits in Chippendale. The Dagonets were a considerable clan, allied to the best names in Baltimore and Philadelphia, but the van der Luydens who stood above them all had faded into a kind of super-terrestrial twilight, from which only two figures impressively emerged, those of Mr. and Mrs. Henry van der Luyden. Mrs. Henry van der Luyden had been Louisa Dagonet, and her mother had been the granddaughter of Colonel Dulac, of an old Channel Island family, who had fought under Cornwallis and had settled in Maryland, after the war, with his bride, Lady Angelica Trevina, fifth daughter of the Earl of St. Austry. The tie between the Dagonets and the Dulacs of Maryland, and their aristocratic Cornish kinfolk, the Trevinas, had always remained close and cordial. Mr. and Mrs. van der Luyden had more than once paid long visits to the present head of the house of Trevina, the Duke of St. Austry, at his country seat in Cornwall, and at St. Austry in Gloucester, and his grace had frequently announced his intention of some day returning their visit without the Duchess who feared the Atlantic. Mr. and Mrs. van der Luyden divided their time between Trevina, their place in Maryland, and Skydercliff, the great estate on the Hudson, which had been one of the colonial grants of the Dutch government to the first famous governor, and of which Mr. van der Luyden was still patroon. Their large solemn house in Madison Avenue was seldom opened, and when they came to town they received in it only their most intimate friends. "'I wish you would go with me, Newland,' his mother said, suddenly pausing at the door of the brown coop. "'Louisa is fond of you, and of course it's on account of dear May that I'm taking this step, and also because, if we don't all stand together, there will be no such thing as society left. End of Book One, Chapter Six of The Age of Innocence.